OK, let's begin. Um, I had the chance to talk to the only member of group five today, so uh, she mentioned that for question one, why does Lily speak freely even though she knows it will get her killed? Um, what group five mentioned is that uh, we have to remember the kind of society that this is. Lily talks about how the government suppresses freedom, doesn't allow thought and, and action and creativity. And it seems likely that everyone else in society would agree with her, but they're just too scared to say it. So think about this. When you're walking around and you know that this situation is wrong and it's terrible, and you know that everyone else agrees, but nobody is saying it. Nobody is doing anything. That kind of feeling, that kind of urgency or necessity over time could be so strong that it could even overpower your instinct for survival. The need to confront something that is so wrong that everybody knows is wrong is a moral instinct. And that moral instinct can sometimes be more powerful than the instinct to survive. That's why uh, we have heroes and martyrs, Xuing Dao, right? Because sometimes somebody has to say something. If we look at what Lily says on pages 37 to 39, we see that she doesn't ask for anything to change, right? She doesn't try to appeal to these secret police. Her main point seems just to be to say out loud the truth. Even near the end of her speech on page 39, when uh, Kors is already physically abusing her and she's in physical danger, the last thing she says is, an insult. She's the last thing she says isn't to save her life, isn't to try to get the police to change their mind. It's to insult the police. Part of Comrade Stalin's program to lower the national IQ. She's basically saying the police are stupid. Uh, so we can tell from this that her main point is simply to say the truth. That's what matters to her. Uh, we often think about communication as exchanging information or like getting people to do things. But there are some situations where simply uh, saying something out loud is itself a kind of change. Even if there's no uh, actual result, the fact that somebody has said it and everybody has heard it itself can be important. OK, so uh, thank you, group five. Other groups, do you want to add ideas or raise questions? OK, then let's move on to group one. Your question is uh, scene, act two, scene two, page 39. It's a very short scene, and it's also a very unusual scene. Uh, group one, why do you think this scene has been included in the play?
Okay, so group one says that this very special scene, uh, maybe it there are two reasons why it's here. The first reason is as a kind of direct address to the audience. This is perhaps one of the only places in the entire play where it's not two people talking to each other. It's one person talking to the audience. The most direct address of the audience. And the other possible reason could be that this is a kind of turning point in the play. Before this point, everybody is suffering and confused. But after this point, maybe some things start to change. We can look more closely at this scene. It's very short, so we can look at it together. Wait for it. This one, act two, scene two. Lights up on Anna. This is the whole scene, by the way. The next one is scene three. This is the entire scene. Lights up on Anna, and then she says, we danced and made love on the edge of an inferno. We tumbled into terror in our carnival masks and our satin shoes. There were people starving who had no shelter, who couldn't read, and we didn't care. Are we part of humanity or just some awful lesson? No one knows the era they're living in until it's too late. And then the lights fade. This ending is also uh, important. Like, look at the ending of the last scene. It says blackout. Blackout means the lights go off immediately. But here it says the lights fade, which means the lights go off slowly, gradually. Let's look at this closely. We danced and made love on the edge of an inferno. An inferno is a great big fire. Um, in English, we usually say we danced on the edge of a volcano, which means that we celebrated and we had fun even in the face of danger, or even if it might lead to danger. So the two main ideas of this paragraph up here, right? Celebration and fun and pleasure and danger. Next line, terror, danger. Carnival uh, is a festival celebrated in Brazil, right? It's full of parades, parties. Uh, important people are not treated importantly. It's a big uh, shift and change in social relations for just one day. Uh, so that's also celebration, pleasure, fun. Satin shoes are expensive, luxurious shoes. So this sentence also, on the one hand, danger, on the other hand, fun and pleasure and celebration. Next sentence, suffering people, suffering people, suffering people, and we didn't care. So these three sentences seem to be saying the same thing, right? In the face of danger and terror, Still, people had fun, celebrated, enjoyed themselves. So the question is, are we part of humanity or just some awful lesson? These celebrating people, are they really part of humanity? Are we all one family? Or is this separation into pleasure and suffering enjoying and terror? Is this just some kind of lesson, maybe like a history lesson for the future? No one knows the era they're living in until it's too late. Uh, this sentence seems to be talking about the people who are having fun. It's like they either don't know that many, much of society is suffering, or they know and they don't care. Until it's too late. 
until the suffering masses rise up and revolt and history changes everything. So what is this passage telling us? It seems to be a kind of warning. Anna is talking about her own society. But we, re we remember that this is only one part of the play. The other part of the play is set in a future society. And it seems like this warning could apply to that future society as well. When so many are suffering, the people who have power don't do anything to help them. So if this idea can be applied to the past and it could be applied to the future, can it be applied to the present? Could this be a warning for the audience? If this play is performed in a very important playhouse, I think it is, right? This play premiered in, let's see, the Victorian Arts Center in Melbourne. So it's a pretty fancy theater. It's not like a local community theater, right? It's, a, it's an important theater. And so usually shows that premiere there will be expensive. People who go to see this play pay a lot of money which means they have money to pay. And if they have money, they also probably have a little power. So could this paragraph, could this speech also be a warning to this rich and powerful audience? In a world full of suffering people, you spend money mostly to have fun. And you don't see this danger until it's too late. So this seems to be what this is saying. Uh, group one also mentioned that it could be a turning point. Indeed, before this in act one, everybody is it's the play is basically describing that society, both societies, describing how people suffer in those societies. And then in the first act of scene two, Lily um, finally speaks up, tells the truth, and then is killed. So up to that point, nothing is changing. There doesn't seem to be much hope. But as we just mentioned, the fact that somebody is willing to tell the truth itself is important. And so now that Lily has spoken the truth, Anna can give us this warning and the rest of the play, Rachel and uh, Anna seem to be looking for a new way out to see if there is a way to continue surviving in a different uh, way. So yes, this scene could also be seen as a turning point. Thank you, group one. Uh, other groups, do you want to add ideas or do you want to raise questions? Okay, group three, your question, sorry, group two, your question. Um, why is the question about the lack of women such an important question? And for context, let's look at page 47. Here, Rachel and Sandor are talking while Anna listens uh, to their conversation. Uh, look in the middle of the page. Uh, Sandor, I'm going to run out of memory space. I can upload from, say, Auden to Rilke. These are two poets, and they're both men. Akhmatova listens distressed which means like she's worried. Um, and then like Rachel and Sandor keep talking and then a few lines down, Anna says, unheard by them. So Rachel and Sandor can't hear her. So she seems to be talking to herself and also the audience. She says, ask the vital question, girl. 
So like Rachel is asking all of these questions about like success and survival. But Anna thinks that there's an even more important question to ask here. What is that question? Page 49, scene 8. Sandor wakes. So the first thing Sandor hears is Rachel asking, why aren't there any women in your list? And Anna says, good girl. That's the question Anna was waiting for. So group two, why is this question so important? What do you think? Uh, we didn't have any solid answers, but we think it could be something along the lines of the, the ancient stereotype of women not allowed to do some things. Maybe, and maybe uh, maybe about how uh, one second. How about we answer this question after the first one? We let us think a bit more. Uh, I got it. Maybe about how women are not allowed to have their ideas, or maybe allow about how uh, the poets of this gen these this generation are not allowed to have their own ideas, or maybe their uh, the ideas they are allowed to have are limited, something along the lines of those. I'm not too sure. Good. So uh, group two threw out some possible answers. I think we can put them together. Uh, so group two says maybe this is connected to how throughout history, women have often been discriminated against. Um, for example, Aristotle famously thought that women and slaves were the same. Um, later, many men thought that women could not actually think rationally. Up into the 20th century, American women were not allowed to own property, own their own bank accounts without a man to sign with them. Uh, throughout history, women have often been treated as less than human. So even though this is the far future, if we look on the same page, Rachel, why aren't there any women in your list? Akhmatova, good girl. Sandor, women poets? I've never seen any. Rachel. Could there be any? Sandor, I doubt it. Even in this far future society, Sandor does not think that women could write poetry in the past. Um, as group two mentioned, in this society, nobody writes poetry. They're talking about past poetry. But even when they talk about past poetry, Sandor does not believe that women could have written any. This fits with the historical pattern of thinking that maybe women are not uh, fully human or not as human as men. Last week we talked about the importance of creativity in poetry. We talked about how poetry is able to more, most directly express and reflect personal experiences and feelings. And that these personal experiences and feelings are at the core of identity. These are what make a person a person and not just a part of society, not just a role that they play in different uh, situations. So if Sandor here, who represents all of the male poets, if they don't think that women were capable of writing poetry, that means the same thing as thinking that women did not have sufficient inner creativity and feelings and experiences to write poetry, which means that women were not fully individual human beings. Another way to say this is 
in this far future society, the government treats uh, especially women like Rachel only as workers. They don't think about women like Rachel as individual humans. And this logic seems to be the same logic that Sandor is falling for when he thinks that maybe women could not have written poetry. Uh, maybe they did not have sufficient inner life to be differentiated from their roles in society. And so this is a very important question for Rachel to ask him. Could women be poets? Sandor, are you wrong? Is it possible that women do have a sufficient inner life and that maybe we don't see women poets not because they never existed, but for some other reasons. And I think that's probably why Anna calls this the vital question. If nobody ever asks this question, Sandor would never have to think about it. And if he doesn't think about it, he would never try to find uh, a record of women poets. And so we see how, like last week, we talked about how Shakespeare was locked away. They had to fight to read Shakespeare's work. Uh, and I remember group three said something like, maybe Shakespeare is more powerful, his words are more powerful, and so the government is more afraid that people would read him. And so they locked his work away. And here we see the result of that policy. When you lock away a certain kind of work, and people never see it, and they start to forget about it, then it's likely that people will think that this kind of work doesn't exist and could never exist. This is the heart of censorship, right? The government thinks if nobody sees it, then it won't exist. Think about historical censorship, like uh, the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. The Chinese government thinks if nobody knows about it, then people will forget and it never existed. It never happened. And this seems to be coming true for younger mainland Chinese people. Nobody has ever mentioned it, and so they don't know that it has happened before. And so this is why th this question is so important. This question can help keep alive the idea that half of the human race is equally as human as the other half. Thank you. Other groups, do you have ideas or questions you want to add? OK, let's take a short break. Uh, next period, after we finish the discussion, I'm going to introduce the midterm exam.
OK, and we're back. Let's move on to question four. Group three, this is your question. On the or near the end of the play, the auditor says there are no or he says foolish. There are no dramas in life in real life, no love, no passion. Why create dissatisfaction and disorder? The horizon you see is the only horizon. Group three. Do you think the auditor really believes this? OK, so group three says, first of all, they think the auditor is serious. Um, the auditor is a person in power, and in this far future world, the logic of this world is total control, right? Everybody has to follow orders. Everybody has a job to do. So drama, love, passion, these are useless ideas, and because they are useless ideas, the society does not allow them. And so according to the auditor, these don't exist. And if you try to create them, it's foolish. It only creates dissatisfaction and disorder. The horizon you see is the only horizon. This is the only society. There is no other society for you. Now, group three adds that um, Throughout the whole play, it seems like only Rachel and Sandor have a deeper kind of connection. Maybe we can call it romance or love. Nobody else in the play has this kind of situation. So they seem to be the exception that proves the rule, right? By contrast, everybody else seems to be living in the same world as the auditor. No drama, no love, no passion. As for the second part of this question, uh, it seems to be saying that this kind of situation, this kind of society will continue in the exact same way as it has always continued. Um, especially because by the end, 
uh, Sandor and Rachel, they don't try to like destroy the society. The only thing they try to do is release literature. Uh, but literature being available is one thing, but whether anyone will read it and do something with it is another question entirely. So there is some change, but their more, their direct objective is not to destroy everything. So it seems like if the auditor is successful in his job, uh, it seems like this society will remain the same. Now, group three also added that in comparison to our society, uh, our society also seems to be very similar in terms of the ideas of drama, love, and passion. These three things seem to be what we see on TV, but not as often in real life. But can we say that there's no drama, love, or passion in real life? It might be rare. It might be so rare that some people never find it in their life. But I think it's probably not realistic to say that it does not exist at all. Let's go back to group three's example, right? We see dramas on TV. We enjoy it when like there's a love triangle and everybody is being romantic. Why? We have to recognize that in order to enjoy it or even to laugh at it. We have to know what it is. Why would we know what it is if it doesn't exist in real life? So even if we personally have not had that kind of super romantic drama, but we kind of know the emotional essence of that experience. We recognize it. We may even want it. Um, or at least a little bit of it. So is there really no drama, love and passion in life? Mm, I would hope that there is still some. Otherwise, what are we doing here? All right, thank you. Other groups, do you have ideas or questions you want to add? OK, let's move on to question five, group four. This is the big summing up question about the whole play. Do you guys think that literature or poetry has a kind of power? And if it does, uh, do you feel it in your own life? And if you don't, do you think this power is important?
Ah, interesting. Group four has two answers for us. The first answer they give is literature does indeed have a kind of power by giving us a story and a specific perspective. It forces us to get out of our own perspective, join this other perspective and therefore start to understand the kind of person that would have this perspective. We see the world from another point of view. We understand what other people might be seeing and feeling and thinking, and we add that to what we already know and therefore we can expand our knowledge of the world and of other people. Yeah. Uh, and the reason we have this answer is because this answer from group five is based on personal experience. Uh, this answer is based on how group members themselves have found that reading something uh, and switching perspectives has led to more knowledge of the world and of people. But by the same token, there are also members of group five who also based on personal experience disagree. They may not, they may agree that literature can have a kind of power, but that power is locked away behind a wall of words. When, for example, we spend three weeks reading these 60 pages. If we don't finish, if we don't understand, then we cannot access that power. And so uh, this answer is based on the personal experience of uh, feeling like there is more power and knowledge in images comic books, videos, movies, that kind of thing. And this is a good point uh, in society today when people are really, really busy, including myself. It's hard to find time to sit down and just read a really good big book. Uh, fortunately, I believe that literature is not just written. As I, to me, comics, movies, TV, even some music can also be called literature. Personally, my idea of literature is that uh, anything that focuses on the language as well as or even more than the idea. So if it has language and it cares about that language, I, th I would call it literature. Uh, so hopefully in this first half of the semester, uh, I have like helped you um, see some ideas about how we can read or how we can experience um, written work and that you can bring these ideas and this experience into the future, the second half of the semester and the midterm exam. Um, so next week, no class. The week after that, week 10, we're going to watch a movie. Uh, and then starting on week 11, we're going to read the book that the movie is based on. All right, so hopefully by watching the movie first, it can give you a general idea of what the story will be like. So that if when reading the novel, you get lost in the middle, you get confused, you can think back to what happened in the movie and that might help you. Uh, right, so that is the end of the first half of this semester. Do you have questions or ideas? Great, let's talk about the midterm exam. The midterm exam will be essay questions. There will be two questions. You only have to answer one of the questions. Uh, I will give you, let's see, it says here one week to answer this question, uh, starting today after the bell rings until next. I think this is Friday. At one minute past midnight. Here are the general rules. These rules apply for the midterm exam and the final exam. So there's a deadline, but there are no timers. So once you start, you have all the way until the deadline to finish. 
right? There's no 80 minutes, there's no 100 minutes. You can just keep going. Uh, but make sure if you need more time, make sure to save your work somewhere else in case uh, your computer crashes or something. So you don't have to write it directly onto Moodle, right? You can write it somewhere else and then copy and paste it into Moodle. You can submit more than one answer and I will only give you the highest grade. So maybe after you submit your answer, you go take a shower, go to sleep, and then in the middle of the night, you think, wait, I forgot to say something. You can write a new answer and submit it, and I will only grade the best answer. Your answer must be in English because this is the applied English department. We are applying English to the exam. That was a joke. The exams are open book which means that you can use any resource you find, including the handout, including anything I post on Moodle. You can use the dictionary, you can use the internet, you can go to the library. The only thing you cannot do is discuss with other people. You can ask me, or you can discuss it with me because I can control how much information to give you. Um, but you cannot discuss these questions with other people. So, right, you can ask me questions, uh, email, teams. If you somehow find my line and add me, I will answer you. Um, or you can like hunt for me during the week and track me down and ask me also. Now, when you answer the questions, uh, in, in addition to the answer, you must also give specific evidence from the assigned texts. So these questions are not just about your ideas. These are about your understanding of what we have read in class. For each piece of evidence, give me the page numbers in parentheses after the evidence. So for example, if you want to give me a piece of evidence from the play, right? Maybe somebody said something and you think this is very important then tell me which page this evidence is. Uh, if there are no page numbers, you don't have to give me page numbers. Wait, no, you do have to give me page numbers. Give me page numbers. If you use information from other sources like the Internet, tell me which part of your answer is taken from that source and then give me the web address or the page number. So like if it's an internet thing, give me the web address. If it's a book, give me the title and page number. Um, this is to avoid plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you steal somebody else's ideas and pretend that they are your own ideas. This exam is to check your ideas. So if you steal somebody else's ideas, then you are stealing a grade that doesn't belong to you. If by doing this, you pass the course, you will be stealing credits, Shrifen, that don't belong to you. And if by doing this, you get your degree, then you are stealing a degree that doesn't belong to you. And if you use this degree to get a job, then you are literally stealing somebody else's job and money. So don't steal ideas. If you use somebody else's ideas, tell me. I'm not saying you can't use those ideas. You only have to tell me which parts of your answer come from other places. Uh, it says in parentheses after the evidence. So please try not to like write, 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 and then put all of your sources at the bottom. Don't do that. Each time you use another idea, someone else's idea, after that, use a parenthesis, and put the source of that idea right there in your answer. That way I know which parts of your answer are yours and which parts of your answer are borrowed from other people. If you do steal other people's ideas and you don't give me the source, I will give you a zero. This exam is worth 40% of your final grade. 
So if you steal an idea and I catch you and I give you a zero, you would have to get a perfect score on your final exam and come to class every single time in order to pass this course. Don't do it, right? Just tell me where you found the idea. That should be fine. Now, uh, if you want to argue with me, this is the standard. If I can find where you found that idea, then it's stealing. I can find it in English. I can find it in Chinese. I've even found answers in Japanese. Don't try it. So these are the general exam rules. Do you have questions? OK, so um, you probably have not had experience with essay questions before. So I have given you two example answers. Uh, these two answers are answering different questions from different classes, but you can still pay attention to how these answers are written. The, the order, the structure, how does it use evidence? Uh, these are two answers that you can uh, consider. It, they may help you in writing your own answers. And if you're interested in the idea of plagiarism and the history of plagiarism, here is an article in Chinese that I think explains it very well. Okay, let's look at the midterm exam. Answer one of the following questions. If you answer both, I will give you the higher grade. One. Which one do you think is more important for college students? Popular literature? or serious literature. Literature includes films. It also includes all of the other stuff I was just talking about. Right, uh, movies, TV, music. If it uses language and it cares about that language, uh, I, I will call it literature. You must answer either popular literature or serious literature. So you cannot say, Either one. You cannot say both. You cannot say it depends on the situation. You must give one answer. And to support your answer, please give at least three examples from the essays that we read in class. So it's not just your own ideas. Please connect your ideas with the essays that we have read in class. When you use that evidence, not all of your examples have to support your answer. But if some examples don't support your answer, you need to weigh the evidence to explain why you choose one answer and not the other. Uh, very quickly, Sam, do you understand what I'm saying? No? You? Yeah. OK, and then I'm going to explain in Chinese. 你举三个例子，不一定三个例子都在支持你的答案。但是如果有不支持的话，你必须要权衡你的证据，然后去衡量之下再说明为什么你选的是这个答案，不是那个答案。Does okay. that make sense? Okay. The easiest thing is just to give three supporting examples. So this is the first question. Question two. In the woman in the window, some characters feel the power of literature, but others do not. Why do you think this is the case? What is different between the two groups of characters? Give at least three examples from the play to support your answer. You must discuss at least one character from each group. So of your three examples, they must include at least two characters. And of these two characters, at least one of them must feel the power of literature and the other one must not feel the power of literature. You can give more examples. You can talk about more characters, but each group has to have one example. Does that make sense? Right. Um, like this question has a lot of question marks, but it's actually asking the same question. Why is this the case? is the same thing as what is different between the two groups of characters. It's just two different ways of asking the same question. Now below that, there is the answer space. It looks like a very big box, but you do not have to fill up the box. In fact, 
if you do fill up the box and you keep going, the box will keep growing. So don't worry about filling this space. How long does your answer have to be? As long as you need it to fully answer the question. So don't worry about the word count. If you think your answer is complete, that's fine. And then click here to submit. Make sure that it actually does submit before you close your computer. Uh, and try not to wait until the deadline because often many people will be submitting at the same time and maybe the computer will crash. Um, the highest score will be 40. But if you answer the question and you do the minimum amount of work, right? It's in English. You didn't copy it from entirely from somewhere else. You answered the question correctly. You gave some kind of evidence. I will give you 24, which is 60%, a passing grade. So the range is between 24 and 40, or 60% and 100%. And the better your answer is, the higher your score will go. The scores will increase by increments of four. So 24, 28, 32, 36, 40. Or 60 percent, 70 percent, 80 percent, 90 percent, 100 percent. If you're missing one of the basic elements, right? Maybe you wrote it in Chinese, or maybe you forgot to answer the question, or you didn't give any evidence. Each thing that you're missing, I will take away four points. So from 24, it will be 20 and then 16 and then 12. But if you plagiarize, if you steal your entire answer, you get a zero. Again, it does not pay to steal ideas. Even if your answer is terrible, if it's still your own answer, you will get more points than if you steal a great answer. So that's the exam. Do you have questions? Yes. Yes, thank you. The question is, how do we avoid plagiarism accidentally? Right? Maybe we have the same ideas as somebody else. The thing is, it's very, very unlikely that you will write about the same thing in the exact same way. So yes, you may have similar ideas. In fact, you probably will have similar ideas, but as long as you are saying those ideas in your own words, that's fine. Uh, and this also means that if, because it is so unlikely for two people to say the exact same thing in the exact same way, if it's close enough, uh, that also could be plagiarism, depending on the language. So like if you change out one word or you change out three words, but everything else is the same, I will also have some questions for you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Cool. I'm going to give you the rest of this period to think about these questions, and I will be here if you want to ask me anything more. But remember not to discuss these questions with your classmates. Good luck.